Good afternoon. Um, I'd just like to welcome Rob Sher uh, Sherrington from Citizens Vice Cymru, Callum Higgins from Citizens Vice Cymru, Professor Richard Owen from the Swansea Law Clinic, uh, Tabid Mir from the Swansea uh, Law Clinic. Firstly, thank you for attending, for considering uh, uh, the uh, legislation, the draft legislation, and the uh, this preparing for this particular scrutiny uh, session. And thank you again to uh, Swansea Law Clinic for the submission that you put in in, in, in writing today. Perhaps if I could just start with uh, a few opening sessions. I mean, uh, opening questions. Um, obviously. Uh, we're aware of the, the very good work that both organisations have actually been doing in, uh, in recent years in an importantly difficult uh, environment. Um, I'm just wondering what your views are on the aspect of accessibility of law, which is, features very much within the legislation and within the explanatory memorandum. How, how will this legislation actually contribute to accessibility? And what are your concerns about the issues of, of accessibility? I'm happy to start with. Yes. Um, well, I believe that legislation that is accessible to the public, written in a clear and simple form, accompanied with explanation of the provisions, could mean, could mean that many people um, financially struggling to seek legal advice um, could use that as an alternative. We find the clinic's been going since 2017. Yes. Uh, and the, the demand for our services has been very great, it has to be said. Uh, and we have people coming from as far afield as Cornwall, Plymouth, Cabridicion, uh, wanting to see our services. Uh, the, main, the main problem seems to be the affordability of legal services, the fact that the legal aid means test has been frozen since 2010. Um, there are specific accessibility issues in the Welsh language, uh, we feel, uh, and increasingly people are having to do it by themselves, uh, either wholly by themselves or partially by themselves. Uh, we're finding particularly in family law cases that they may uh, wish to draft a petition by themselves and then think they can afford uh, a solicitor for the financial matters or the, the child contact matters. Uh, so we, we think this, this bill will help in terms of accessibility. Uh, the reason we think it will help is because increasingly a new audience for legislation exists, which is the general public. Uh, and legislation in the past tends to have been written for members of the legislature, for the executive, civil servants and legal practitioners, whereas the public now is increasingly having to read legislation by themselves. So having it all in one place means they will not require some of the legal research skills that are currently required in order to locate legislation. Thank you. Well, um, similarly, kind of our, our services have um, increased not only in the amount of people that we're getting through the door, but in the complexities of issues um, that we're getting through. Um, and when you kind of look at it, the, the kind of profiling of our, of our clients, um, they are twice as more likely to be um, to lack basic digital skills um, and twice as likely not to have access to the internet. So in terms of, um, as Richard was just saying there, the people are doing it themselves, is in terms of how these people go about finding them, they're finding that increasingly difficult. Um, the majority of our cases, 61%, is done through face-to-face -face contact, again, because of these, these issues. Um, so we, we think it'll help, really. Having everything in one place certainly will help. Um, and, uh, and in one place, not only to help the citizen, but also in terms of helping our advisers um, and giving the best advice that they can. And just to reiterate what Rob has said, um, you know, there's sort of three distinct groups, really. You've got the citizen themselves, um, and they struggle with just interpreting the law and finding, knowing where to find it, um, so that it will benefit them, having it all in one place. Uh, advisers, they're strapped for time, and resources so knowing where to go looking at one specific place for the law is very helpful and similarly legal professionals who might be involved in giving advice um, to citizens directly it saves them um, time makes it more efficient for them and clearer where the law is and um, how to interpret it 
And so, please. Another reason we've we think the, the bill is needed is even when you can get legal services their accessibility can be a real problem particularly in rural areas of Wales uh, where we have something of a demographic time bomb we've got a lot of sole practitioners who are approaching retirement age with no succession planning so the worry is that will go over the edge of a, a cliff and we'll suddenly find ourselves without areas of Wales being covered by by legal professionals uh, and um, also there is much more um, likelihood these days of, of accessing legal services through some digital means uh, and obviously mid, mid Wales has some areas with bro broadband connectivity so, so we worry about access to justice in that, that way as well. I suppose that's quite significant isn't it on the technological side that uh, in the past the only people who would have had access to uh, Hallsbury statutes and so on would have been uh, lawyers whereas now anyone can google a piece of legislation there and I suppose that's significant but in terms of accessibility per se um, there's accessibility which benefits the administrators of law lawyers and so on uh, and you've mentioned within your written evidence you focus quite a lot on the individual the individual citizen and so on um, taking that broad sweep of, of all those aspects of the of the law what more could the Welsh Assembly be doing what would you like to see the Welsh Assembly doing uh, in terms of increasing accessibility, improving accessibility and understanding what are the weaknesses in what is being done at the moment, what more could be done that would improve the uh, issue of accessibility? Well, well in, in some respects, more, more of the same. In the sense that the, um, the area of Welsh legislation that we most have to deal with in the clinic is, is housing law and the Housing Wales Act, it, it's clarity, the way it's written. Uh, is very helpful. Uh, so that's that clear, clear mm -hmm. language. Um, as I've said in the written submission, we're very keen on accessibility programmes being defined quite, quite widely, uh, and for a certain pe public legal education component uh, to them as well, uh, as well as looking at new forms of law making, sort of collaborative, mm -hmm. more collaborative uh, methods. Uh, there, there are plenty of examples uh, across the world where, where more collaborative, cooperative methods of legal drafting are being used, and we think that's something that could be considered under these accessibility programmes, uh, as well as computational law principles, where, where we have legislation available digitally, how can that be tailored in a way uh, that someone can find out the legislation that applies to them and their particular problem? We see that as, as quite an important uh, matter to address. Okay, then anyone else want to add? Or? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to say that um, as a student, when looking at legislation, I've, I found it quite convoluted and confusing and very archaic. And I think that an improvement for the, in, the, in the legal profession for the future is to simplify and um, explain legislation in, in, a, in a clear way. And in, if that were to occur, members of the public could, it would it'd be much more accessible and um, user-friendly for the public. And I think that will help accessibility. Well, there is another student advisor here, Isabel Francis, and, and I think that, that if you could not to shake your head as well, I think that that, that is quite widely uh, shared experience amongst the, the student body, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, please, yes, Callum. There, there are some good examples, I think, of, of what can be done and what has been done in the past. Um, looking at the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, mm -hmm. there were some really good, um, easy read versions of what the legislation meant and the effect of that legislation on the citizen, which meant that if you didn't understand legislation, you weren't a lawyer, you could grasp the basic concepts of the legislation by reading these versions which were available free online on the Welsh Government website. So more of that, I would say, so that people who aren't familiar with legislation, how it's constructed, can get the concepts and what it means to them directly from a, a free, accessible source. Thank you. Uh, Dyloid. Yeah, do you have a that? Thank you very much, Chair. Turning now to part one of this bill in terms of improving accessibility by consolidation and codification, now naturally we accept what you say in your paper. Now, the Council General's draft taxonomy for codes of Welsh law state that consolidating the law will involve bringing 
together all legislation on a particular topic by reenacting laws previously made. That's his definition, whereas codifying the law will involve organising and publishing the law by reference to its content. Is that your understanding of the terms consolidation and codification? Who would like to go first? Um, a bit I agree with what you've said. There are some good examples of consolidating the law, such as the Housing Act and the Social Services and Wellbeing Act. There are good examples there. The next step, I would say, is to codify it so that everything is available in one place. That's what we understand by codification of the law. Or, um, from the law school, any comments? Uh, yeah, well, legal definitions of codification uh, often in include incorporating common law principles and so on, uh, which probably could not be done for this type of exercise, we feel. We would, we, we would like everything grouped together, uh, so the primary legislation, secondary legislation, and codes of practice even. Uh, we have a slight concern, though, that the public will not know the significance of these hierarchy of legal norms. So we're very keen to see some sort of user guide to sort of, sort of help people through this. And we don't think it's just a question of lumping it all in one place, because mm -hmm. there will have to be some elements mm -hmm. of reform, we feel, to, uh, yep. to weed out overlapping and inconsistent provisions and so on. But, but if that happens, uh, we, don't, we don't think the public will be too concerned about these legal definitions of consolidation and codification, that they'll be interested in the end result, which is, can I find the law, can I find the law easily, and we think this helps with that. But it didn't clear it. Therefore, is it clear to you from this bill and its accompanying documents what codes of Welsh law are intended to look like? Would it have been better, for example, if the Welsh Government had published an online version of a code for illustrative purposes, just in order to explain by providing an example, or is it clear to you what a code would look like? Um, From our understanding of the government's proposals to date, it is clear what a code is. I've looked at the taxonomy, it does look clear. It's been presented in a clear manner that would be accessible to the public, perhaps lawyers would want to look in more detail at some of the issues that we've raised today. But for the public, I think this version is clear for them so that they can understand what a code is and where law would sit within that code. I have a specific question for the Swansea Law Clinic. You've already mentioned in answering a previous question the principle of computational law. So can you explain what computational law principles could be used to improve the accessibility of law in Wales? I'm not a computer specialist, but I understand that the computational law approaches uh, law and legislation from a different standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, and as lawyers, we tend to see legislation as text, and we're very text-based in our approaches to law, whereas a computer scientist will see legislation as data. And so obviously data can be coded in different ways uh, to get different search, search results. Uh, and what is of particular concern to us is how will the public know what law is enforced, mm. currently enforced, rather than law that's enacted and not in force. Uh, and uh, can they have different ways of searching uh, databases so they can find what is the law that's currently enforced today yeah. and uh, search it in a different way and find all law that's enacted. Uh, and uh, get, get to some result. Uh, I have spoken to computer scientists, and I understand that is possible in terms of coding, that is achievable. In terms of the resourcing and effort, uh, yeah. I'm not, not so sure about it. So. I'm not quite completely sure how much clearer I am <laughs> as to what that actually meant. Is it, uh, uh, is, is in a way, digitising uh, uh, law that's been consolidated and simplified, and so it's basically a, a way of using yeah. technology to contain uh, uh, consolidated and codified law. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And putting in different search, search requests and, and then getting different tailored responses. I think that, that's what particularly interests us. Uh, so, uh, so, as I say, there would be a way of... I'm interested in housing law in Wales currently in force. 
we've told. Uh, oh, and I'm interested in housing law in Wales, and you'd get a different search result. Yeah, and it's a very different thing to artificial intelligence, is it? Well, as my understanding of artificial intelligence, that's machine learning, isn't it? Was, yeah. Uh, so it gets more sophisticated the more data that it, it gets hold of, uh, whereas this would be more the coding stage. When you put it into the... When you digitise okay. it, you will put some way of signalling if this is in force or this is not in force. Uh, unless anyone wants to add to the, uh, the discussion around computational um, mm. resources, I'll, I'll go on to Carwin Jones. <laughs> Who may want to? <laughs> Not on the computers. <laughs> computers. So good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, when you were talking about simplicity of drafting, my uh, memory was taken back to the Offences Against the Person Act, 1961, where even if you had it in front of you, unless you were a lawyer, you, you wouldn't understand what it meant. Uh, what are those malicious, grievous? What, what do they mean? What is GBH with intent, and so on? And so uh, <laughs> that, that law is particularly obtuse uh, when we look at uh, modern times. What I wanted to ask is this. In terms of a code, there are two ways to uh, approach uh, a code in my mind, or two main ways. One is to produce a code that is a true code in the sense of the civil codes that, that exist in, uh, in other European countries, where effectively the code is the sole source of law. It's effectively one large act, I suppose you could call it that. Or uh, the approach could be to bring together all the existing legislation into, as it were, a catalogue. So if you're looking at what the law is in, for example, planning, then all the legislation will be listed there in the code itself. Which approach do you think is best in terms of accessibility? Do you I don't think either is wrong. I think, um, as you said, they're, they're both valid ways of doing it. I'd say they both play to different audiences. So. I'd say the catalogue version probably suits lawyers more in that um, it's split into acts and then you, just, you need to look at which act applies to the situation you're looking at, whereas the, more, the sole sort of one code, I think, would apply more to the citizen to be able to understand. So it's, it's all in one very contained space, whereas a catalogue is still um, something which professionals, I think, would, would easily more, handle more easily than, than the citizen. So would you be saying that there's a, a conflict, as it were, between the two systems in terms of who, which system suits which audience? Uh, would, would, it, would, you, uh, would you be saying, for example, that the catalogue-based approach, which is not it's my, my wording, uh, is more suited to practitioners and the true code approach is more suited to members of the public? I think it's a balancing act, whichever way you do it, because you are always going to have these, I talked about them earlier, the three sort of different sets of people that we have in our organisation that would be using the law. Um, whichever way you do it, it's going to suit one group more than another. Um, and if you are trying to make the law more accessible, I'd say focus on getting it to the citizen and letting lawyers then work with, <laughs> work with it um, as they would anyway. Whereas if you focus the practice of codification on for the lawyers, um, you lose out on making it more accessible to the citizens. So focus on the citizen side of it, because lawyers will find a way of working with the law anyway. Um, but I think it's, it's always going to be a balancing act. I wouldn't say conflict. It's just something that you have to balance when you, when you go through this exercise and just keep in mind these different audiences. OK, thanks for that. Uh, the other question that's been brought before this committee, which which there's no easy answer at this stage, is what do you do with legislation that doesn't fit into one code? So, for example, you have the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, which arguably would fit into each and every code that the Assembly might have. Uh, similarly, this legislation is not easy to uh, identify in, ter in terms of where it might uh, go in a particular code. So I suppose there are uh, a few approaches that could be taken. One approach might be uh, for legislation to be produced and uh, a header as part of that legislation saying this act fits into... Uh, sh should be read as part of this code. And that's one uh, approach that, uh, that, 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 that might be taken. Uh, or uh, a, an act could appear in more than one code. So it could appear in the Wellbeing Future Generations Act, could be in every, each and every code rather than just one. What, um, do you have any views on, on what the best system would be in terms of trying to ensure that we don't get this leakage? Uh, uh, out of uh, one particular code, and we end up in a situation where we have legislation that sort of sits between codes and, and 
then the whole thing becomes confusing uh, once again, both for practitioners uh, and for the public. We're very concerned about the cross-cutting legislation because legislation like the Future Generations Act and obviously legislation that implements rights to do with children and the disabled and um, elderly people are uh, important rights. And of course, there is some evidence from Dr. Nason's work uh, that there are less administrative law claims in, in Wales that, than in England per head of the population, whereas you'd expect at least, least the, the same number. I mean, there's, there's no real easy answer to this. I think we want people alerted to the fact that there's cross-cutting legislation, uh, whether it's in user guides or explanatory memoranda or some other ways that, that it's signal to people that you may have to read certain overarching legislation in conjunction with this code. Um, the, the problem of repeating it in different codes is I think one priority should be to try to make the code as short as you possibly can. I mean, as, and as far as is appropriate to make it short, because sometimes you need length for precision. But again, in terms of making it user-friendly for citizens, I think we need to make the codes as short as is appropriate. Uh, but with reference to, in some way, shape or form, to this, this, these overarching pieces of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask you, just following on from that then, um, of course the codification and consolidation relates to statute law. Uh, um, of course we operate a, a system that uh, involves statute and common law and common law principles in particular that are still very significant. Uh, Council General has said that obviously he's not going to try and deal with the common law uh, aspect. Is that an approach you agree with or do you have any views on that? I think um, for members of the public it may be difficult to understand court judgments and of course, most court judgments are available on subscription services that practitioners have access to usually. Um, but I do believe a, s a simplification or codification of common law judgments is useful because, as you said, it is still part of the law in England and Wales. So um, members of the public can have access to the whole, all of the law, not just the legislation or the statute. And of course, yeah, again, um, I think it should be codified and simplified and not necessarily the whole judgment being stated. You'd see, would you, is that, are you suggesting a codification should incorporate then in some way um, relevant uh, judgments? That, Common, yeah, yeah. I, I do. Okay, thanks for that. Anyone else want to, yes, uh, Callum? There are pros and cons to doing, to doing it both ways. Um, our concern would be if you do codify a common law principle, does it then become fixed if you know that's beneficial in some cases and not in others um but we you know we can see that it it has its benefits if you did it but, but it's a massive step just to codify the legislation in the first place and that would be beneficial to citizens without the common law element um being incorporated so you know, we're supportive yeah. of the of the stance being taken currently okay um i'd like to ask you a little bit then about um, part two of the bill um, as you know, we have the uh, 1978 Interpretation Act. Of course, since then, uh, we've had a, a, an enormous amount of Welsh legislation and, of course, a, an ongoing legislative programme, so increased divergence of, uh, of law. Um, in your view, do you think that this legislation is necessary? Or would you have preferred a situation where we just continued with the 1978 Act? Um, I suppose what I'm really asking is whether you can give your views as to uh, how important this particular legislation might be, bearing in mind the growth of the Welsh body of law. Well, again, we think part two would be helpful because of its reduction in size. Uh, its potential to reduce the yes. length of, uh, of statutes which we think would, would help our clients. Uh, so on that basis we support it. Uh, and of course the, the Interpretation Act 1978 is quite old uh, and that predates devolution so there are a number mm -hmm. of terms which it would not cover uh, because of its age. Do you think there is scope for confusion over the fact that of course you'll have the 78 Act continuing up until uh, the 1st of January 2020 and then of course uh, the uh, uh, the Welsh uh, 
le uh, legislation taking uh, effect from then onwards? Do you think there is scope for confusion there, or do you think it follows sequentially clearly enough? Yeah. Yes, there, there is scope for confusion. And I think probably on balance, the benefits outweigh uh, the disadvantages. Uh, and of course, one of the current disadvantages, the Interpretation Act doesn't have terms in the, in the Welsh language. Uh, and there are accessibility mm -hmm. issues which are specific to the Welsh language. And part two will, will help with that. Are there any particular rules that cause you concern, having looked through the uh, legislation? Um, I mean, we've, we've had some evidence already about concerns over, for example, the uh, issue of service of documents and the implications of that. Um, do you have any particular concerns over uh, any of the rules? No. Uh, I'm aware the profession is quite concerned about the rules to do with email posting of, of documents. Uh, that is not something we sort of experience from the type of work we yes. do. But I know that that is quite a widespread concern amongst the profession. Yeah. No. Uh, we, as long as we think as long as it's clear when this applies and when from, then it'll be beneficial to Welsh law and, and its progression um, in the future. And doing it at this point is much easier than leaving it until later when it's much more needed. So, yeah, we'd, we'd support the Interpretation Act as it is you know, um, in principle. But we can't see any significant issues that we we're concerned about. Well, yes, sir. I have seen um, arguments that the well-being should be included in the list in Schedule 1, uh, mm -hmm. which, which I don't think would be helpful, actually, because the Social Services and Wellbeing Act and the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act have two different audiences. So uh, I see the potential for that actually causing potentially confusion. So. Well, I think there are some specific questions on uh, Schedule 1 to the bill and the defined terms. Uh, Carmen Jones? Yeah, uh, just going back to Mr. Slightly about the issue about codifying the common law, I suppose if you code the common law, it isn't the common law anymore. The whole point about it is that it's a, it's a precedent-based system and you know, it's equally as effective because murder, of course, is a common law offence. It doesn't exist in statute. And if you start codifying common law, you can start codifying equity as well while you're at it, So, uh, which is a, a, it's a job that the, the government will be particularly keen to carry on at, the, at this stage. Uh, on the issue of definitions, an interpretation act, of course, is one way of dealing with it, as you've already mentioned. An interpretation act can't be exhaustive. It can't possibly cover every single imaginable term, I would have thought, that could appear in, in statute. So what is the best approach? Is it an interpretation act that acts as the, the, the font of the more widely, the font of definitions of the more widely used words, or continue the system where definitions are included on the, in, in the act and the bill itself? So, for example, let's take the, the uh, word land. You could suppose put land into an interpretation act and it would be the same in, in any legislation. Do you put it there or do you put it in, uh, in, an, uh, in a piece of legislation that, uh, that deals with land? So, so really, I suppose, what, what do you think the best approach is? Is it an encyclopedia of terms that sits over here? Or is it defining uh, each and every term on the face of a bill in the bill itself? second option that you've given there, you are making it more accessible for those infrequent users. Um, they'll have a list of everything that's in front, what X means, what Y means, what Z means, and that'll make things a lot easier from their point of view than having to cross-reference an encyclopedia. That said, I can see the arguments for both, but I think in terms of if you're looking at it, the citizen's point of view, we'd, we'd go with the second option there. As law is digitised, I mean, there, there would be the potential, I thought, as you hover over a term for the definition uh, to, to come up. Um, that's obviously only on available for digitised versions of, of yeah. legislation. Um, again, if, if it's not included in the Act, then obviously that, that shortens the Act. Um, so, so we would see advantages with, with that, as making it as appropriately short as you, you possibly can. Yeah. Do you have any concerns about the timescales and how long it might take for the bill to make an actual difference to the accessibility of Welsh law? I, I, well, of course, the, the Law Commission of, of Wales and England has been, been going over 50 years and is still, still embarking on consolidation and codification processes. So by its very nature, it is a long-term um, long task. Um, and it, it could well be a generational task. I mean, 
personally, I would like to see some sort of end date, a target end date, where even if it were 25 years hence, which gives us some ability to, to judge the success of the legislation. Thank you. And do you, um, with Brexit and everything, what's happening now, do you believe that now is the right time to prioritise um, and put resources into processing this bill? Um, you know, or, or should those resources go basically to Brexit, social care, housing and everything like that? I think we're seeing growing demand in our advice services and with that we're seeing kind of more complex issues. Um, and with those growing complexities, it's making harder for our advisers to give good and accessible advice. So the quicker that gets fixed, or, or at least makes it easier, um, the better in our point of view. So in terms of if not now, when, um, I'd say that the people need it as soon as possible and we, we'd welcome it as, as soon as is as possible. In terms of... Um Welsh law and, and it's relatively young you know the assembly is, is a young institution um, starting now makes it much easier to consolidate acts rather than leaving it when you've got more legislation to be consolidating and codifying in the future um, so you have to start somewhere the earlier you do it is probably the the easiest and most efficient point to do it so uh, we'd say you know, it, it this would increase the accessibility of law quickly you know, for um, our clients and it would be easier at this point to do it rather than waiting for the future. Thank you. And oh, yes. I've interviewed clients as a student advisor at the law clinic and I've witnessed clients who are financially struggling yet not eligible for legal aid because of the high, because of the high threshold. And I think um, one of the clients actually said that they came to the, the clinic because we're a pro bono service and even organisations that are less expensive to going to a solicitor's practice that provide legal solutions are um, limited in resources and can only do so much for the client. They may not be able to um, be consistent throughout the whole case of the client. And that's why I think that a, a, a database or resource that the public, members of the public can access which is easy to understand, which codifies the stat this statute in a, in a simple and um, clear form, um, would greatly help because because then people could um, do carry out their own legal research and discover their own th discover their legal rights without having to spend money. Yeah. Also, I, I think it is addressing a societal problem because access to law is an issue that affects society and there is reason to believe that, that there are certain rights that have not been accessed in the way that they, they could be. And I don't see Brexit necessarily as being something uh, in opposition to this process because as laws are repatriated from yes. the European Union, they, they can be incorporated into the codes. Yeah, so. yeah, all those laws coming back. Mm. Um, how would you assess whether the bill, once it's enacted, has been a success? Uh, well. Uh, uh, from our point of view, um, we'd look to our advisers on the ground um, and if they're more confident and prepared to give the advice to, to our clients, um, essentially, and, and how easy they find it to give that advice, I guess. And um, if, on, on the bill, if you included a duty for Welsh ministers to review the operation of the Act, um, what time span would you put over that? Would you give it, say, five years to lay the report of its findings before the Assembly, or would you shorten that time or lengthen it? I think shorten, because it's such a significant bill that I think it would need um, a review quite soon after. Yeah. It's a very innovative bill as well. There are very few international precedents. New Zealand possibly being the best example. But that's what makes it exciting, uh, and it also means that we sort of support not defining key terms such as accessibility because these things need to be worked out as they go along but because it is so innovative, innovative frequent checks will be sort of beneficial we feel. Fantastic. Yeah we'd agree that you know um, setting one review point um, wouldn't very be helpful for it's, it's a moving beast so looking at it frequently over the next few years to see how it develops what extra challenges we might face um, I think is more beneficial than setting a single point where you want to review it. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Dyloid. Yeah, just a, a... Yes. 
Of course. We all see an opportunity here to develop law through the medium of Welsh, and there is an opportunity, as you mentioned, there is an exciting opportunity in terms of interpreting legislation bilingually, because languages don't translate directly. There is an issue of interpretation too, and there's an opportunity for co-drafting rather than drafting law in English and then translating it to Welsh. So there is that opportunity for co-drafting as happens in Canada, as we've already heard this afternoon. They don't use Welsh there, of course, it's French and English. What do you think about that aspect of things? Well, drafting legislation bilingually makes for better legislation. If you look at the terminology and in two languages, then you will look at it and consider it in more detail than you would if you were working in one language. You don't consider every possible meaning of the word. So, giving both languages equal status from the outset and then looking at the legislation in terms of how people are going to be making use of that law on a day-to-day -day basis is a positive. And also, in looking at the principles contained within the bill, we are looking at creating resources in both languages, which will put people in a position where they will be able to use the Welsh language on a daily basis in our courts of law, and the resources will be available to support them in doing so. So we think that the bill makes improvements, certainly in terms of the use of the Welsh language in law on a daily basis. Um, we, we did an English by default report, uh, and the most um, the, the reason Welsh speakers gave uh, spontaneously to not using Welsh on certain things was um, the idea that it wasn't clearly accessible. By having this kind of two-pronged uh, approach and doing it equally, we, th we, we think that it will make everything a lot easier to use, um, to use Welsh as the first language in, in law. I agree with what's been said. As a university law clinic, our concern is people who want to use Welsh through legal process and so on have difficulty finding advisors, legal practitioners who also speak, speak the Welsh language. So we have some concerns about the sister's qualification examination, which is due to come in in 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, we would like to see that to be accessible in, in the Welsh language as well. OK. Um, did you have any more questions? No, no, sorry. Well, listen, no, I think that brings us to the end of the questions. It's been extremely helpful, both in terms of your written submissions and uh, your answers today. Uh, you will receive a transcript of the evidence to check through that. If there are any points you think we haven't covered, you'd like to write in on, then we're happy to receive any communications in that respect. Only to thank you for giving up your time for attending this committee today. I hope you found it useful. I know we found it useful in terms of the, the scrutiny and preparation work that needs to take place as legislation passed through its very stages in this place. So we will adjourn now for uh, five minutes. Thank you very much.